Good morning. How are we doing? All right. Everybody enjoy that extra hour of sleep you got today? Hey, look, there should be on your seat a card, okay? I want you to grab this card, all right? I want you to hold it up, and you're going to make a covenant with me this morning in the Lord. (laughs) Say, I will give this card to someone who needs Jesus, all right? Say it. All right. Amen. Okay. You have made a promise. All right. All right. It can be a stranger. I don't care. Just give this card to someone. All right. We have more. If you have 10 people who need Jesus in your life, which you probably do, uh, take some cards. So Easter is coming up, obviously. We have a lot going on. Okay. The week before Easter, we have our big pop-up shop where we serve our community. There's information about how to donate online. We've been talking about that. And then Easter weekend, we have Good Friday. We have our Easter egg outreach on Saturday at Timberlane Elementary, and then we have services on Sunday. This year, we have added a 6.30 a.m. sunrise service, all right? Woo! Woo! So all of you who love getting up early, all right? And those of you who can help us make space, all right? Easter's a pretty crazy day, all right? The parking lot's already crowded on a regular day, okay? So 6.30 a.m., come to sunrise service, all right? And you'll have your whole day. You can go to brunch after, all right? All right? It'll be great, okay? So... Uh, come join us on Easter. Give this card to somebody. Give 10 cards to somebody. Um, if you're here today uh, and you are a follower of Jesus and actively wanting to love him and pursue him, uh, you know, Easter is one of the best chances ever at someone you love being willing to begrudgingly come to church with you, okay? All right, so take your shot. Take, shoot your shot, all right? See what happens, okay? So use this card on your advantage. All right, one of the uh, first cars I ever drove, I learned to drive, actually, on a stick shift. How many of you can drive a stick shift car today? Okay, some of you, all right, all right, all right. The real people out there know this business, all right? So I learned how to drive, which learning to drive is hard enough, but learning to drive a stick shift, you know, so is very different, all right, which I'm glad for, because when I met my would-be wife, her car was a stick shift. And if I was trying to date her and couldn't drive her car, I think that would have been an end game. So... I was prepared, thank you, Lord Jesus, and I drove, I drove her car and looked like a real man, you know, okay, so uh, I learned to drive on a stick shift. Now, one of the things about stick shifts, you know, is you have to shift the gears. Well, <clears throat> I had this old, well, it was, it was sort of new back then, I had this Mitsubishi Eclipse, all right? Anybody know what an Eclipse is, okay? I was super cool. I had a spoiler on the back, and uh, this is, I think, a Southern thing. I used to leave a visor hanging from the rear view mirror. Okay, I don't know, anybody do that in high school? Nobody is just, okay, you just weren't as cool as me, I guess, all right? I don't know what's wrong with you. I literally remember when I met my, my would-be wife, who's my wife now, when I met her and started dating her, she was like, that visor's gotta go. What are you doing, you know? The holes in your pants gotta go, okay? She just, she just transformed me. So I had this visor hanging from the window, a nice silver Mitsubishi Eclipse spoiler on the back, you know, <laughs> you know I, was, I was really cool, and I would learn how to drive. So the thing about driving a stick, obviously, you start in first gear. As you get going, you move to second and third and fourth. Eventually, if you're on the highway or something, you settle into fifth gear. And when you're in fifth gear, there's no need to go to another gear. The next gear would be reverse. You don't want to do that. And so you're in fifth gear. Once you're settled into fifth gear and you want to keep going forward, there's no need to shift out of that gear because that's the gear you need to keep going. The only shifting that happens once you're in fifth gear is if you need to go slower, if you need to slow down. But you don't move forward once you hit fifth gear. You need to stay in the gear so that you can keep going. Now, the same principle is what Colossians and Paul is trying to teach us today. This is why the message is called Don't Shift. The idea being that once you're settled into who Jesus is, once you know the gospel, once you're following Jesus, then the the challenge, as Paul's going to say, is don't shift from the hope that you have in Christ. That is the very thing that enables you to keep moving forward. And it is when we shift away from putting our eyes on Jesus or putting our thoughts on somewhere else, that we shift out of that, that's when we begin to go down, that's when things begin to struggle. If you tried, I don't know how many of you know this by experience, if you tried to shift out of fifth gear lower while also trying to go faster, you'd like explode. You know, this is not, things would not go well, okay? This is what happens to us in our spiritual lives though. We get into a rhythm with Jesus, we focus, we believe in the gospel of Jesus, we put all of our hope in Jesus, 
And then circumstances or things come, and they provide difficulties, whether it's uh, circumstances from the outside, whether it's internal struggles, whether it's doubts I have. And all of a sudden, I still aim to move forward, but I shift from putting my hope in the cross and the gospel to putting my hope in something else. I've shifted. I've put my hope in a circumstance. I've put my hope in something happening different in my life. I've put my hope in all these different things, in situations working out, or getting married at this time, or having this, or having that, or having being successful in this promotion, or my body getting better. All these things, I begin to shift from my original hope, which was Jesus, to something else. And when I shift from Jesus to something else, my life begins to crumble and fall apart. This is what Paul is going to encourage us with today is to say, once you are settled into the gear with Jesus, don't shift. Don't put your hope or focus anywhere else. So go ahead and open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. Let's go. go. We're going to finish, actually, the text I had last week. So we didn't get to the end. I don't know if you noticed, but I pretty much just I finished the sermon without finishing these three verses. All right. So. We're working through the book, and I will not skip any verses, all right? So we're going to go back to here, which is funny, because when we had the passage last week, which was kind of long, it was like eight verses, which is long for me, I guess, and DDA texted me, he was like, I don't think you're going to get through all these verses. You know, this is a long passage. And I was like, I got it, I got it, you know? And he was right, I didn't make it through. Okay, so we're going to go back in time, and we're going to cover 20 through 23, all right? So starting in verse 20, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So if you were here last week, and if not, I I ask you to go listen to the sermon from last week, because that that chunk that we did last week was all about who Jesus is, the preeminence of Jesus, the one who made the world, the one who sustains the world, the head of the church. And then the overflow of this reality of who Jesus is is now the reality of our lives the good and the bad, and what, what is who Jesus is, what does that matter to us? So this phrase that Paul has here, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, is the focus of our time today, and is the focus, I think, of this particular passage. The reality is, is that when we shift from the hope of the gospel, we are no longer stable. It's our shifting hopes that makes us unsteady. It's my shifting hopes that makes me worried about the future. It's my shifting hopes that makes me anxious in the present. It's it's my shifting hopes because I've taken my focus off of Jesus and I've put it anywhere else in the world, even on good things, I become unsteady. So it's that simple. As soon as I put any hope in anything other than Jesus, my life becomes unsteady. It becomes unsteady because nothing else is good enough other than Jesus And there are no promises that certain things will go a certain way in my life other than Jesus will guide and be enough. So as soon as I get off of that, for any reason whatsoever, my life becomes unsteady, shaky. And what I hope today is to give all of us a sense of stability to set your feet back on the solid ground of Jesus and maybe some of you for the very first time. Because part of this is before you can catch a good rhythm in fifth gear, you have to go into first gear, all right? You can't go from zero to 100 like that. You have to go into first gear. And there's some of you here or watching online, you haven't even started a relationship with Jesus, and that is the problem of your life. You need to shift into gear and into trusting into him. I promise you, and you've experienced this anecdotally in your life. You've experienced this every day but the difficulties that you have that seem to never get answered. You cannot move forward in life until you begin with Jesus, okay? There is no moving forward. The car is dead. You cannot shift into life. You cannot shift into gear. You cannot get anywhere until you begin with Jesus. This is the reason why you keep trying the same thing over and over again. It never works. And so I want some of you to shift into gear with Jesus today. You need to do that. There's a lot of you who need to keep going with Jesus and not shift out of the hope that you've put in him. So this passage kind of reveals to us the process of how this works. So not shifting is the end goal here. 
and I'm going to go back to the beginning of this passage and help you work it through. Uh, I'm going to give you three phrases to explain this passage, okay? These three phrases are these three. One, sin creates separation, okay? That's the first part of the passage, okay? The second part is separation then requires salvation, okay? And then the third part is salvation creates a foundation upon which I build my life. So this is the process that every human being needs to go through, and some of you are in step one, step two, step three. So sin creates separation. That's the main problem with sin, creates separation. Separation then requires salvation. The only way to fix separation is salvation, and if you're in salvation, that creates a foundation upon which you build your life. Another phrase you could write down to help you think through what does this mean for your life is this, is that maintaining stability requires staying focused on your Savior. Okay, if I want to maintain stability. So let's say sin creates separation. Separation requires salvation. Salvation creates, uh, leads to uh, foundation upon which I build my life. So if I try to build my life on anything else other than the salvation that was my original hope and answer, I will begin to build my life in the wrong place. So if I want to stay stable in life, if I want to maintain stability, I need to focus on my Savior. That is, that is a very simple but profound reality for us from this passage. And so let's start at the back and work our way forward. The first part, sin creates separation. This is very important to understand. Look at verse 21, it says, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You see, so he says, and you, which when we read the Bible, we should think, and you, this is you and me. So this is good news and bad news, meaning the, the flow of the passage is this salvation is available to you. And you, hey, great, like you are a part, a participant in this amazing thing Jesus has done. It's not abstract, you're not following some weird religious system or whatever. Jesus has done something and it includes you. Praise the Lord. Now, the bad part is, it also means you, you think me, is like, this is me are alienated, meaning separated, and hostile to God, doing evil things. Okay, you just have to accept this part, this basic premise. You're gonna look at yourself and say, I, by nature, am hostile to God. I do evil things, evil things, me and you. This is the problem, and therefore we are alienated from God. To be alienated is another way just to say to be separated from God. It's to be separated from who he is. And the reason, listen, the reason we're separated from God is because we are hostile, look what it says, in mind, and then we live out our hostility of our mind by doing evil deeds. I just, in our, in our society that wants to believe that we are all inherently good, and the idea being that even how could God, you know, punish I'm trying to be a good person. How could God punish me, okay? That, that completely negates the basic reality of our life, okay? We are made in the image of God. We've gone over this. It makes us valuable. It helps us have potential. But because of sin, we are now separated from God, and we are not just a little unfriendly. We are hostile. We really have to understand what's happening here, okay? Hostile in mind means that we are deliberate and willfully, consciously rebellious to God. Our rebellion to God is premeditated. It is willful. It is what we want. Okay? This is, it's not something we say. It's not something we're caught up in. It's something we choose to do. It's not just because I was around the wrong person. No, you are the wrong person. Me too. We are the wrong person. It's not, you know, how many times we say, well, well you know, let's say you say something, and you say, well, I didn't mean to say that. Okay, but you know you sort of did. You know it. There's a part of you that totally meant to say that awful thing. And often we excuse our behavior with things like that, you know, oh, it's not so bad, or I just got caught up, or you know, my emotions got the best of me, all these different things. But say, no, 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 
The reality of our lives is we have premeditated and willfully chosen to reject the sovereign authority of God, his leadership in our lives. We have said, no, thank you. We have chosen to take our own way. This is the seriousness of our condition. And you and I inherently know this. We, by nature, reject the fact that I must submit to someone else's way. And we are willfully, consciously, premeditatively rebellious to God. This is the human condition, okay? We are his enemies. And because in our minds we are hostile to God, we have chosen to live out our hostility with our hands and our feet and our eyes and our ears. We have not only been hostile in our thinking, but it hasn't stopped there. The Bible says this has led us to do evil. Okay, I know this is maybe for some of you hard to accept, but it wouldn't be so hard if you began to think about what really is true about your life. We are a people who naturally do what is evil. And because your standard of evil is that you haven't killed someone yet or committed adultery, you all of a sudden think you're a decent person. When God's standard of evil is even one simple thought in rebellion to his loving leadership. God's standard of evil is one word, one thing that crosses his perfection to say, as soon as I cross God, the pride that rises up in my heart, the greed that goes through my mind, the lust that runs through your body, all of these things and the choices that you make out of this, every act of them are evil. The Bible describes them as evil. And so part of what I just wanna do this morning, especially maybe for some of you who are are outside of Christ, I just want you to see the issue here. I'm not asking, I'm not saying, okay, well, you're you're a decent person, your problem is sort sort of small. If you add Jesus to your life, your life will get better. That's not what I'm saying. And some of you have treated Jesus that way. I'll just add him to my life and maybe it'll make my life better. No, 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 no. The problem is much bigger than that. You don't need to add Jesus to your life to make your life a little better. You are in rebellion to God and you need someone to reconcile your relationship to him. And you do not have the ability to do it yourself. Let me read some more scripture for you on this. I know this might land hard, but we gotta, you know, self-awareness is the first step towards making a difference, you know? This is like counseling 101 is just let me get you to say about you the thing I already see about you. I want you to say it. And as soon as you say it, you will accept that it's true about you. You guys all know this. If I said it, or if you said it to someone else, it's like, ah, no, 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 defensive, you know? But if you can get the other person to say, oh yeah, that's me. Okay, now now we're moving. I just wanna create some self-awareness, all right? in your life this morning. Look at Romans 8, 7 says this, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. See that? The mind that is set on the flesh. A simple way of saying, the mind that operates according to what my body wants to do. The mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Look at this, it cannot. It is impossible for you on your own to submit to the law of God. You simply don't want it. You are willfully rebellious. Ephesians 4 says this. Now I say and testify the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, here's the phrase, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. Another word, alienated, so separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. So you get this. Their mind, the rejection of God in the mind has led to being separated from God, to live in ignorance. It is hard in their heart, and look at verse 19. They have become callous, have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. You see, the mind rejects the leadership of God. The heart gets hardened to his love and affection. The life begins to live according to the flesh. And this is where we are, a group of people who are this way, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, this is true for those of you who are outside of Jesus currently now. It is also true for any of us, even in Jesus, if we try to live outside of Jesus. Living outside of Jesus isn't a whoopsies. No, it's a hostile act to God. And it creates this life flow to say, listen, this is very important. If you do not guard your thoughts, you will become futile in your thinking. 
Your thinking will lead to being hard in your heart. Your heart will get callous and not sensitive to the things of God. As your heart gets more callous, you are more willing to go into your fleshly desires because you don't have the same conviction you had before. So sin separates you from God. That is true for everybody in terms of your human condition. It's also true in your experience, even as a Christian, to say, you can't be separated from God's love eternally, but in your experience of his love, if you choose to keep sinning and disrespecting his leadership, your heart will grow hard to him. And that will lead to make it easier and easier to sin. And some of you are in that situation where it's just really easy to sin. And the reason for that is because your heart is hard. Your heart is hard because you let your mind go. Hostile in mind, hard in heart, doing evil deeds. This is the process, okay? And this is the process we're all in. We also must remember, this is very important as Christians, those of you who are in here and you call yourself a Christian and you follow in the Lord, to say, as you live in the world, okay, and we want to be loving and kind, you still, though, must remember you operate in hostile territory. You live on enemy ground, Every day of your life, a lot of people that you meet and the systems of the world around you are in willful, conscious, choice, choice, like choosing rebellion to God. That's the world you live in. That's the workplace you go to. Those are the people in your neighborhood. This is the reality. And we, yes, we do it with love and kindness. We ask them to know Jesus. But you have to remember, if you don't keep your guard up, you will completely get knocked over. This is why you need the armor of God. You live in hostile territory. And you must remember every day you wake up, the world around you isn't somewhat whatever about God. No, it is antagonistic, premeditatively, consciously, willfully rebellious to God. As you, you know, once were yourself. So to walk around and not be aware that every moment of the day The devil and his army and the entire world are stacked up against you. Now, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But if you took your eyes off he that is in you, then you would be totally consumed with what the person in the world can do to you. See, I don't have the confidence anymore if I don't look at that. Now, some of you here may say, okay, okay, okay. I'm separated from God because of my sin, whatever. What does that matter to me? Oh, hey, I don't even care about God anyways. So if I'm separated from God, that's not a big deal to me. Okay, thank you for being honest, all right? Here's what I want you to understand about why this is important for you. To be separated from God, okay, is like a child who gets separated from their parent. Some of us feel like, okay, if I'm separated from God, who cares? I could just be free. I can do what I want. I can live how I want. Who cares what God thinks, okay? Well, There's two problems with that. One is to be separated from God is like to be separated, like a child separated from parents. If a child gets lost with their parents, okay, and none of you parents have ever done this, I'm sure. A child gets lost in a crowd of people. The child doesn't all of a sudden, like a seven-year-old, wouldn't say, I'm free. Yes. I can do what I want. I can go where I want. Yes. No. What is it? What strikes the child? It's terror. Where are my parents? I don't know what to do, I got no money, and there's a bunch of adults around me, I feel unsafe. And that's the situation of the child. And for me and you to be separated from God our Father is to be separated from the only one who can provide, lead, care, and help us. To be separated from God, your separation from God is the reason why so many things in life are so frustrating. It's because you were made to be in relationship to him. So even as we talked about last week with Jesus and who he is, he's the head of the church. He's the creator and sustainer of the world. He's all of these things. He's the most important man in the world, the most important being in existence. To be separated from the sustainer, right, is to now suffocate. To be separated from my provider is not to have enough. To be separated from the one who gives me life is to live dead on the inside. To be separated from from God is to be separated from the purpose and meaning of your existence. That's why separation from from God matters, and it's the reason why things are so hard. And your separation from God is killing you, and that's why Jesus has now come to restore that relationship to God, because it's the one thing you need. 
And not only is that a matter of fact in your earthly life, but your separation from God is even worse than that because if you choose to stay separated from God now, he will give you what you wish and you will be separated from God forever. And God is the only one who has anything good about him. So if you're separated from God forever, the place the Bible calls that is hell, and hell is the definition of the absence of all good things. You have to remember, the only reason you can enjoy the taste of a cheeseburger right now is because God lets you do that. He lets you do that. The only reason you can experience any good thing and a smile and a laugh, I'm not even talking about these huge things, any good thing on earth comes directly from God and is available to you while you're on this earth. And if you choose to stay separated from God and choose an eternity separated from God, not only will every little good thing be taken away, but all good will be taken away and you will suffer in a place of eternal pain and torment because God's not there in his love. And so I don't want you to stay separated from God. You are not free. You're like a kid who got lost at Walmart, okay? It's not cool. You're not free. You got no money and you don't know what to do, okay? Your separation from God is not, not cool. You're not cool because you do what you want, okay? It's foolish. And I want you to stop doing that, all right? Thank you, okay, great. Okay, your sin has separated you from God. Sin creates separation. Okay, the second part, separation requires salvation. Look what he says. So the next verse, verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. So God's answer to alienation is reconciliation. We are enemies of God. This relationship is broken, okay? We don't just need counseling to restore our relationship to God. We need a mediator. We need reconciliation. So how does a person that's separated from God get restored to God? And the Bible here says, by the death of Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? Let's read a verse. Romans 5.10 says, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled or made right with or brought to God. How? By the death of his son. Much more than if we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So it is the death of Jesus that wipes away the sin that has created the separation. Okay? Okay? You need to follow this, it's very important. The reason why your good works can't unite you with God is because it's not that you need to do more better, it's that you need your sin, your rebellion, you need that forgiven. You don't need to do more better. That doesn't make you a Christian. You need for your sin to be forgiven, all right? And everybody knows, okay, even though in some sense you need to sort of forgive yourself for things, you let things go. You can't forgive yourself, okay? This is just, the problem is you're separated from God, okay? Sin has separated you from God, great. Okay, now I understand. Now I can't do better and climb my way to God. That's not how a relationship gets restored. There has to be forgiveness, okay? Well, I can't forgive myself and make right with God. I can't say, well, okay, I'm sorry God, you know, I've, I forgive myself, I feel bad. No, 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 you need to be forgiven by God, just like you need to be forgiven by your wife or by your friend. For a relationship to get restored, the one who is offended needs to be the one who grants the forgiveness. You can't walk into that, that time with your wife and say, I forgive myself for the bad things I said to you. <laughs> Try that next time, see what happens. You're gonna come to church with a bruise on your face, you know, you say, this is not, I forgive myself, you know. Okay, okay, okay. You'd be sleeping on the couch that night. Okay, that, you can't do that. You have to have a, a conversation, and if she, then when she chooses to willingly forgive you, then the relationship can begin to make progress, okay? This is just basic. You know this already, so it shouldn't be weird when you apply it to God. If your relationship with God needs to be restored and you have willfully chosen to reject him, then he needs to forgive you. Okay. Now, how does God forgive people? Now here's the issue, and this is where Jesus makes the big difference, okay? Let's say God forgives you just because he wants to. You know what? I'm just gonna let it go, right? I think I've shared this example with you before. This is very important. Imagine if somebody like harmed somebody you love, like killed somebody you love, they go to court, and the judge says, you know what? I'm feeling very forgiving today. I'm just gonna let you go. Don't worry about it. Don't kill anyone again. Would you be like, oh, that's the nicest judge in the world. 
what a nice guy. When I'm in trouble, I'm going to come to him. You know, like, no, you'd be like, that's unbelievable. You can't do that. Okay, the same applies with God. If our sin has not only willfully rejected him, but has harmed other people, if God were just to say, hey, bro, don't worry about it, then that would be unjust, and we all know it. You can't just die, stand before God, he says, no biggie. All those evil things you did to harm all those people, all those wicked thoughts you had in your head, hey, don't worry about it. We love when that applies to us, but if he did that for someone else who hurt you, you'd be like, you can't do that. So that's the problem. God can't just forgive you because he wants to. He can't just wink his eye at you. He might be nice at that point to you, but he's not nice to the other people. It's called unjust. Okay, so God can't just forgive you because he wants to. So what is he supposed to do? What is he supposed to do? And this is how, this is the difference with every religion when it comes to Jesus. To say in every other thing, there's these things you might be able to do, but at the end of the day, God just forgives you because he wants to. In Jesus, there is a payment made to clear the debt. And so I deserve to die. My sin has separated me from God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So what I have earned from my sinful behavior is death. If I die, then the sins will be atoned for. But if I die, then I'm stuck forever separated from God, dying every day forever in hell, apart from God. And so Jesus comes down. He takes on flesh like you and me. He becomes a man, a real man with flesh and bones, God of the world. He becomes a man. He lives a perfect life, one that you and I should have lived. He never offends, never lies, never cheats, never has an evil thought or an evil deed. He is not hostile in mind. He is peaceful in mind. He never Never does evil. He is always pure. And then he goes to the cross. And what does he do? He takes all of our sin and he shoves it on his real body and he dies the payment that you and I deserve. So all of God's anger towards your sin gets put on the cross and it's paid for. And so now, when you put your trust in Jesus, it's like double jeopardy. God can't punish you for something he already punished Jesus for you. And so instead of God saying, I just wink it away, no, he says, my son took your sin and he died on the cross and he made the payment that was necessary. And so when I see you, I see his perfect life. This is the gospel, this is the good news, which is why you need the death of Jesus. Okay, and this is why Jesus makes the difference. No other way, no other religion solves this problem. Say, how can God love me and forgive me while also upholding the righteous justice that he should uphold? How does God do that? He does it through the cross. And it is not only true in the scriptures, it is the only logical way. It's the only way that makes sense. And so Jesus now does this. He dies on the cross. He gives his body for me, all right? He doesn't come halfway to me, he comes all the way. He gives me everything that he has. And because he dies, I live. So Romans 6, 23, as I shared, it says, the wages of sin is death. What I have earned because of my sin is death, eternal death. But the gift of God to me, a gift to me in Jesus is eternal life. Sin creates separation, and separation requires salvation. The only possible way to be reconciled to God is to be saved from your sin by Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. It is the only way. And this reconciliation, I want you to see what Jesus has done is massive. Verse 20 says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. All things means all things as categories, okay? I'm just gonna throw like a one minute theological thing so nobody throws anything at you. There's this thing called universalism, which is the idea that God eventually just saves everyone. So there's no hell, don't worry about that. You know, even if you screw up or you follow another religion, all these things, uh, you know, whatever. Eventually God just, he saves everyone. And they'll misinterpret verses like this. So someone comes up to you, I just want you to be ready for that. He says, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven, making peace by the cross. So you think about, hey, God's gonna reconcile everything. So it must be a way, you know. Well, I wanna, I wanna make you clear on a few things. One is that all things means all in categories, not in specifics. All things meaning heaven and earth, all things will be brought back to the unity for which it was created. These are categories. So heaven, earth. So remember, heaven and earth in the original Garden of Eden were one. 
God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Heaven and earth were one. Sin separated earth from heaven, separated people from God. And so what Jesus has done to reconcile all things is big categories, reconciling people to God, reconciling earth back to heaven. One day, all these things will be united. A way to think about this is the reconciliation is between heaven and earth, not hell. Heaven and earth are reconciled, not hell. Meaning that like all the demons who have you know, forsaken God and been doing evil all this time and all the ones who rebelled against him, let's say for, for example, those, those demons, they're not reconciled. And everyone who chooses to, re- to reject the free offer of Jesus Christ, let me just give you some chapters. Matthew 25 and Revelation 20 are two chapters in the Bible that make eternal judgment an obvious teaching of the Bible. I'm not asking whether you like it. I'm not asking whether you believe it. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says. So if you're gonna use Colossians 1 to tell me something the Bible says, let's do some real work and let's use the whole Bible to tell us what the Bible says. Okay, never let one verse alone tell you what the Bible says. That's how people trick you. You need to know the Bible. So Revelation 20, Matthew 25, make it abundantly clear that there is an eternal judgment that awaits those who disrespect and choose to, and do not choose to follow Jesus. Philippians 2 gives us the same impression when it talks about how every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Meaning that some will do that because they love to, and some will do that because they have to. But no matter what, there will come a day when no one is allowed to reject Jesus anymore. His authority. They will have to begrudgingly, through gritted teeth, bow the knee and speak with the tongue, you are Lord, it is undeniable. That day is coming. What I plead with you, and I spend my whole life trying to get anyone to know, is that now is the chance to do it willingly so you can be on the good end of that, so you can happily say, yes, Jesus is Lord. Do it now. Don't do it through gritted teeth later. But I'm just telling you, you may think you can live the life you want now. You're being fooled. You may think you're in control of your own life now. You're fooling yourself. One day, you will be forced to comply with the leadership of Jesus Christ. It will come by force. So I just plead with you, well, you're gonna have to do it. You cannot, for your entire existence, reject the leadership of God. So do it now. Repent from your sin. Receive his, God, his love and his mercy to you. So peace, you see how it says, making peace by the blood of the cross, meaning that ultimately, one day, the Bible teaches there will be a new heavens and a new earth, where Revelation 21 tells us there will be no sorrow, no crying, no tears, no sadness, none of that. There will be a place of perfect peace. And one of the reasons there will be a place of perfect peace is that Jesus has restored his people, but he has also gotten rid of all evil. So the peace isn't everyone gets at peace with God. The peace is that peace has been restored. The king has come in. He has kicked out all the evil, and he has created a place of perfect peace. So it's not that everyone gets to benefit from this. Now, you have to understand from the Bible, everyone has the opportunity to benefit from this. And especially those of you here today or watching online, you can receive Jesus Christ today, be reconciled to God, and be at peace with him. But that's what that verse means, and I hope it helps you understand a little bit. Okay, the last thing here is salvation creates foundation. Okay, so you have sin creates separation. Separation requires salvation, and then salvation creates a foundation. He says, to present you holy and blameless above reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Okay, the result of this reconciling work of God is a new life, a new life, a life that is, instead of evil and hostile, look at the words now, holy and blameless. This is a common theme throughout the scriptures. If you were to look at 1 Corinthians 6, it does the same thing. It's these categories. You were once this, and now because of Jesus, you are this. So since you are not this anymore, live like this person now. You were once separated from God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. But now because of Jesus, you are reunited to God. You are holy. You are blameless. Live like who you are, not who you were. This is who you are. It's not who you're trying to be. Let me just put this in your heart this morning. For the Christians in the room who feel defeated, you are not the person who is defeated. In Christ, you are already holy. You are already blameless. You are already above reproach. 
This is how God sees you, not because of you, but because of Jesus. And so now, instead of you just trying to become something else, just be that which God has already empowered you to be. You are not defeated. You are not the victim. You have the power of God in your life. You are not now unholy. You are holy. Live like the holy person God has enabled you to be. The the devil has lied to you. You don't have to stay stuck. You don't have to keep doing that. That is not who you are. It's who you were. Don't let the devil lie to you like that. It's not who you are. It's it's not who you are. It's who you were. And you tell him back. You tell him back and say, no, 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 no. I don't have to do this. I don't have to think this way. Not because by my willpower I can get better, but because Jesus Christ has already transformed my life. I am not who I was. End of story. And in Jesus, I am something different. The reality then becomes, this is the foundation upon which I build my life. He says here, if you continue in the faith, not shifting from the hope that you put in Jesus. So the if continuing in the faith teaches us that, a way you can say this, once again, just throw a little theological thing in there, that perseverance is evidence. Meaning that it's not that you get the salvation if you keep going, it's that if you keep going, it reveals the salvation was legitimate. It's the perseverance. So you can't just like trust Christ and then just go do whatever you want and say, okay, I'm good. No, 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 no. It's the continuing, even though you fall, you struggle, but it's the continuing. He's saying, hey, if you keep this up, it'll reveal that that was legit to you. That's what he's talking about. It's not if you keep this up, you'll earn it. It's if you keep this up, it's evidence to you that Christ is real to you. And not keeping it up should be evidence that he might not be real to you. That's kind of what Paul is getting at. But the final phrase here, and it was the point of the sermon now, as we get through all of that, is to say, therefore, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Meaning that, okay, okay, okay. If my biggest problem in life has been resolved in Jesus Christ, and all of my hope is in him, all of my hope for my life now, all of my hope for my purpose now, all of my hope for my fulfillment now, all of my hope for my forgiveness now, I have now the foundation of my life, okay? What I build the foundation of my life on is not my circumstances getting better or some other way to do things or things working out like I like. The foundation of my life is one thing. It's Jesus Christ. And upon Jesus Christ, if I stay with Jesus, I will stay stable and strong. I will be able to keep going. But if I try to shift gears, I will lose momentum. My encouragement to you, therefore, is in light of everything Jesus has done for you, there is no better place to keep your attention and focus than on Jesus himself. If you're feeling unsteady this morning, shift your focus back to Jesus. If you're feeling troubled this morning, put your attention on Jesus. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, he's here, ready to receive you. Let me pray and let's respond to God. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Help us to keep our focus and attention on you. And I pray this morning that you would keep us in fifth gear, so to speak, that we would keep our focus and attention on you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There's going to be a prayer team down front.